Next Radio 2018 with Broadcast Bionics. Next Radio. Hello. A man at Peterborough Station that I met in a slightly rumpled suit told me he was on the way to meet a grandson his wife had longed for. She died ten days before the baby was born. At the ticket counter inside, a woman with these incredibly immaculate eyebrows told me how she'd been exploded on an IED in Iraq, and her Victoria Beckham it bag concealed the fact her buttocks and thighs had been blown away in the explosion. Everybody has an amazing story. Everybody. Probably not just one. I've got one, and I bet you've got one. This is where the clicker doesn't work. Oh, there we are. No. As I'm talking, you're probably thinking of it. It's probably burning a hole. Some stories do that. They're like secrets you can't wait to unload. Others come tumbling out. You don't need to winkle them out at all. A couple I met in Hanoi, originally from Yorkshire, emigrated as teenage sweethearts, have adopted an entire Cambodian village, literally, their grandparents to hundreds, and they couldn't wait to tell me about it. Here's some other examples. But how do you get these stories out of people, perfect strangers, not your mate down the pub after a few rosés, but people you've never met before? And how do you do that when you're waving a bloody great microphone at the same time? What you need is a clever little device, something that works almost every time. Or in this instance, just one simple question. Have a listen to this. At the end of this canal is a bridge. On it, people crisscrossing on bikes or on foot from one side of the water to the other. And I'm dying to know, where are they going? I'm going to work and uh, my, my shift starts in 15 minutes, so... Uh, I need to fix my bike, so... <laughs> I'm going to Rio. <laughs> to Rio? Rio in Brazil, yeah. Next week there's a design week in Rio and they invite me as a, one of the keynote speakers. <laughs> so I'm so very happy. Have you done your speech? Prepared your speech? <laughs> Not well enough. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to leave the dogs out there so they can pee and poop. Then I go shopping, clean the house and then... Uh, we start uh, cooking and then it's evening. It's a normal day in a normal life. <laughs> Amsterdam in the autumn, and I'm interrupting people in that ordinary day and so often uncovering the extraordinary simply by asking, Where are you going? I'm going to Rotterdam. I'm going to visit someone who's been my pen pal for about 17 years. And whenever I can get to try and make it to her once a year if I can. So tell me about when you became pen pals. We were members of a feminist punk writing collective. And um, we wrote a lot of letters and made zines together that we sold at punk gigs. And for my 30th birthday, I bought myself a round the world ticket, contacted 20 of them and said, who wants me, who doesn't? Booked my itinerary around them, met Hilda at Amsterdam Central Station, soul sister, straight away. It's been almost 20 years. Tell me about Pen Pals and how it's kind of shaped your life. Well, I actually started, because I was agoraphobic for two years, I couldn't leave my house, but I'm a writer and I wanted to remember how the world still worked. So I got letters from Rotterdam and, and Thailand and Louisiana and from these wonderful women and it kept my head above water. So I, I needed their letters. The letterbox was as far as I could go. So um, they were my lifeline, and that's why they're still a huge part of my life now, because they helped me come back above ground. Oh, she has to go to work. I'm sorry, but thank you so much. Enjoy your day I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's an example of how the one question goes from dogs that are peeing and pooping to a woman who couldn't leave her house for two years. Just 
So simply, it's beautiful. The idea is brilliant, and I can say that because it wasn't mine. It belongs to Jo at Loftus Media. And I'm not quite sure she knew how genius it was when she had it, how that moment of interception between A and B creates this weird, intimate bubble. I live in Cambridge, and my neighbour, of course, is a Jungian psychotherapist. It's either that or an astrophysicist, where I live. And she told me that people often do the big reveal in the last five minutes of the couch because it's safe. They're leaving. What else could happen? There's no comeback. And that's what happens with this programme. And we've tested the theory. We've been... It's not scientific, but we've been all over the place. We've been to Tijuana in Mexico. We've been to Calcutta in India. We've been to Brussels, to Reykjavik, to Amsterdam, as you heard. And one of the best places that we tried it was New York. It's another longish clip. I don't know if I'm pressing this or if you're pressing this now. Here's all the places. Um, but one of the best places we tried it was New York. You can imagine why. Have a listen to this. He slurs a bit. Where are you going? Me? I can't say the hell because I know I'm not going there. Where are you going now? Right now? Me, I'm going to get some crack. And then I'm going to go probably to a friend's house. I don't know which friend's house. And entice them so that I can get a place to smoke. You've not got a place of your own? No, I sleep in the park. Is that good? It's all right. I catch pigeons in the morning. Sorry? I catch pigeons in the morning. I sell them to the Chinese restaurants. And I turn that into crap. You sell pigeons to Chinese restaurants? Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and they sell them as what? They don't sell them, they eat them themselves. It's a delicacy. Yeah. How do you catch a pigeon? I feed them when they come close, I jump on them. Okay. How much do you get paid for a pigeon? Right now it's $5. I up the price. How many pigeons do you catch a day? It don't matter. Sometimes it could be 50, sometimes it could be two. And that keeps you in drugs? How did you end up sleeping in a park? I went on a crack bench. You get it? And before then? Before then I had dirty guys working for me. Until this one girl just popped up. She gave me one little blast. I ran in the bathroom. I sat on the toilet. My heart started beating a thousand miles a second. <laughs> And I thought it was going to explode. And then, it's like boom, boom, boom. Like regular beat. And this feeling came across me like I've never had in my entire life. And I asked the girl, I said, don't ever let me come down for it. And then seven months later, my rent control department was gone. 450 grand in my safe was gone. My business was gone. I sold my empty shape when it was empty. And now I'm sleeping in the park bench. <laughs> Slightly freaky. Um, the thing about this kind of journalism, I'm running out of time, is it sets it apart from a lot of radio <clears throat> where real people are kind of manicured, case studies sometimes, or volunteers in a phone-in, and you sort of know what you're going to get or what the producer wants you to get. And the beauty of this kind of free-fall is it's like those choose-your-own-adventure stories. You could ask one question and it could go one way. You could ask another question and you could end up with a totally different story. And as a local radio journalist at BBC Cambridgeshire, I was once sent out to do a story about bus timetables and ended up meeting this couple who'd met at a prisoner of war camp. He'd seduced her with vegetables he'd grown on the men's side of the camp and put them under to the women's side of the camp. And I didn't record them, and I'm gutted still. It was 2001. <laughs> and that kind of human interest story where there's no constraints is the sort of radio that I really like best. This photo is taken from the jungle refugee camp in Calais where we made an edition of the programme where people actually weren't going anywhere a lot of the time. I was going to give you five tips. There's really no point. You just have to be very bold, very breezy, and very human. Most people 
don't want to talk about the politics they've left behind or the meta things that are happening around them. Like these guys, they want to talk about who they love and who they've lost. And all of us know about that. Thank you.